So um, today I'm going to talk uh, talk to you about uh, five mindsets uh, to succeed as a data scientist, but really as a data person in general, uh, in real life. Um, and so I lead a data science team at, at Levi's. We um, started about a year and a half ago or so, and uh, we've been like doing some cool things there. And you know, more than happy to talk about that later on. But uh, let's get into the you know the talk quickly. But before that, I want to get to know all of you a little bit. Um, how many of you would call yourself a data scientist, data analyst, or something of that sort? Oh wow, so quite a few. How many of you manage teams uh, with data scientists? Okay. How many of you would consider like a data person, like your day-to-day -day job revolves around data? Yeah, okay, cool. So almost everyone here sort of tends to fit that bill, so I think I can keep the talk fairly data-centric. Um, so with that, um, I want to ask you a question real quick. Um, well, uh, um, how do I get this thing to go away? Oh, no, that's not the right one. Hmm. So um, for some reason, this thing, OK, cool, it went away. Cool. So uh, this was Glassdoor. I just pulled this this morning. Uh, it, it shows you like the, the average salary bands for data scientists uh, you know, in, the, in this country. Um, and so the question is, I mean, this is a lot of money, right? I mean, it's a lot of money. Um, so what do you think is what, what data scientists do that's so valuable? What, are, what is it that they create that's, you know, that companies are willing to pay this much money for? What do you think? Yeah. Oh, there's a hand up there. Yes. You're helping companies either make more money or save money, so that's what justifies the cost. So they're helping companies make money or save money. I think there was an answer here. Or something. Yes. Say decision making. Decision making. They help with the decision making. Um, all very you know, good answers. And uh, I would say, in a, in a more concise way, what data scientists do that is so valuable is that they create concise generalizations. Uh, now, what does that mean? Um, so before that, uh, the world that we live in has sort of changed in a very fundamental way today, which is that you know, most of the data that we are, you know, that we are seeing was like, never before you know, seen up until two years ago, for example. And we live in this like, data deluge, which has created this like, interesting phenomenon where you know, earlier, I would say about a couple of decades ago, the world used to be like really data poor. Um, but now we are like, we have so much data, we don't know what to do with it. And uh, hence, like data itself is not the most valuable commodity anymore. It's, uh, you know, insights and knowledge and information. And if you think about it, that's really what the process of data science is, is that how do you take this like, this like ton of data that, you know, that you're getting from all possible sources and condense that into information, and then into knowledge, then into wisdom. And that's, so this is called like a D, the DIKW pyramid, basically. And I would posit that this is the value for data scientists. Now, um, what does that sort of mean in terms of uh, you, know, you as a data person? So the analogy I like to give, and this was uh, something that a friend of mine who works at Juvo um, uh, uh, told me, is that um, data science is a lot like observational astronomy. Now, what does it mean? Um, what it means is if you think about what observational astronomy is, is that it's a process where you like kind of, kind of look at the stars and like, you know, you try and sort of like, you know, understand the patterns of these heavenly bodies and then you try and like sort of like, you know, understand some trends and, you know, come up with some kind of a law that connects these heavenly motions together. And that's a lot of what data science is, uh, to, uh, you know, in a, in a very simple way. Because uh, you could think of it like, you know, as a, like all these different motions of these heavenly bodies, these could be, you know, this could be your clickstream data, this could be your transaction data, this could be, you know, actual people moving around in the city, or, you know, uh, or it could be, you know, the, the, the stock prices moving around left and right. Um, and this is really what, you know, most people um, sort of see, you know, when, when they see, look at data, right, is that this, all of this complex motion going on. Um, and there used to be a time actually where businesses could just look at the data, um, and there was, you know, there was the right amount of it where they could actually sort of make guesses from it and just sort of make business decisions and it was like, you know, everything was great. But now the number of, you know, these observations have, has increased so much that your business leaders, they, they can no longer just look at the data and like make decisions without falling prey to the, the standard cognitive biases. And so that's why we need people who can then, who can look at this, this, all of these observations take very copious notes and like figure out trends and patterns and you know similarities between uh, different types of things apply the mathematical thinking and like you know sort of the the scientific rigor necessary and then come up with some amazing simple laws that connect all of this complexity in one simple formula and you know when you think about sort of you know when you build like a random forest or a linear regression or a logistic regression 
what you're effectively doing is that you're trying to create a simple condensed formula that explains most of the variability in your, you know, in your data. And now, not everyone here can like, you know, create something as grand and concise as our homeboy Newton did, but at the same time, what you can all do is you can follow this principle of Occam's razor, uh, which is that you know, the simplest explanation is often like, the, most, you know, the most sort of useful explanation here, which is that let's say you, know, you, could exp let's say you saw something, some phenomenon in the data, and you wanted to explain it. Now, you could come up with some very convoluted explanation that explained all the variability, or you could come up with something that's very simple that explains maybe 80% of it, uh, but still like, does you know, a good job of explaining that 80%. And that's what really gets into the, uh, like the bias rate and trade-off that a lot of us like, sort of deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is that how do you create a model that you know, sort of explains most of the variability without actually you know, sort of overfitting to the, to the data that we're observing? And that's kind of like, at the end of the day, like, you know, what we want to all achieve as a data scientist or data person really is that you know, how can we create these really concise generalizations that can explain most of the variability? Now, one might ask, like, what is the value of doing that? So, has anyone here heard about this uh, thing called gravitational uh, catapults? Anyone, anyone from physics or astronomy? Yeah? Would you like to explain what a gravitational catapult is? Well, you get a slingshot effect by kind of moving around a concentration of Right. So what we do is that, as you can see in this QT animation, um, you can like, you, now this is actually being used this to, like, you know, right now, like this has been around, people have been using it for decades now, or actually at least a decade now, which is that they launch something in orbit It'll go into space, and it will basically use the gravitational field of a larger body like Jupiter or the Sun, and it will use that to increase its velocity and then be shot off into space somewhere at a faster velocity than we could have ever launched it at, right? And why am I giving that example? Because we can only really leverage the rules of the universe once we understand them. And once we understand those rules, we can do a whole lot with it. And that's really the whole point of you know, having, like, that's why companies are hiring data scientists, is that these data scientists can actually look at the data and they can tell them the universe, the, the laws of these universe that these companies are operating in. Because once the companies know these law, once the companies know these laws, they can then leverage them to you know, shoot themselves into like, you know, outer space, basically. So that's the first point. The second point is, uh, the second mindset, rather, is that as a data scientist, you should really, really try to develop a really good BS filter. Now, what do I mean by BS? This. Um, can anyone take a guess as to what this what this is? It's 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 well so it's a it's a it's a result page of Google image search. So can anyone guess what term I search for here? Yeah, yeah exact hundred you know ten points right there. So um, I mean all of you you know most of you raise your hands right. It's like how many of you deal with something of this sort on a day to day basis? How many of you are actually like programming like a like a like a you know sort of a humanoid type robot thingy. I mean, some of you are probably doing that, but like, is this really your daily job? I mean, I don't really think so, right? But when you look at AI, and like when you talk to people like who are like in the business of AI, like most of the presentation will start with some slide that looks like this, right? And this is utter BS, like this is not what we're doing every day. And, um, and it's like, we're in this really weird situation, which is uh, that if you think about it, uh, this is actually a real slide from CB Insights that does like research on like, you know, companies on the stock market and whatnot. And, as you can see, like the, the companies that use the term AI has shot up significantly since 2015. Um, and uh, while big data has flattened out, which is kind of interesting, is that how are you doing like, anything that's machine learning without using a ton of data? Anyway, um, so there's companies that are like, you know, saying that they're cl claiming to use like, AI in their earnings calls. And then, so that led, you know, so Dan Ariel, who's like, one of the most, like, I would say, famous like, psychological researchers, like, said something very interesting about big data which I would say equally applies to uh, AI, which is that you know, everyone's like, really doing it because they think everyone else is doing it, so they don't want to be left behind, really. At the same time, so this was about what's happening on the, on the enterprises side. On the other hand, there's a whole sort of uh, you know, plethora of uh, startups which are like mushrooming every day with, you know, the, with the domain .ai. Um, and this is actually pretty interesting that you know, companies that have the .ai domain raise 3.5 times the, mon the venture capital that a company that without the domain.ai. And this is one is saying like, you know, this how many, like, you know, when you index like, you know, companies with .ai, how's the funding? So, I mean, pretty clear trend, right? So there's like, it's a pretty perfect storm that's, that's, being, that's happening now, which is, uh, you know, all these startups like, which are sort of like, you know, claiming to use AI, like, I mean, uh, uh, so it's kind of a joke, but basically it's like, uh, this is kind of what's happening a little bit. And uh, 
So now you have this like perfect storm where you have the companies on one hand who, who want to use AI but they maybe don't understand it fully, and then you have the on, on the other side, you know, startups who are trying to take advantage of all the hype, which leads us into this situation where like you know companies really want to like build this pyramid or ascend this pyramid, and for them to ascend this pyramid, you know, what they need to invest in is to actually build this pyramid out. What this pyramid is, is actually a great illustration by uh, one of the, my favorite data science uh, people named Monica Rogatti, which is that you know, to do any kind of AI machine learning, which is at the top of the pyramid, you need to build like, a strong foundation, right? So you need to have like, good logging, good sensors, like, you know, having good sort of data practices. Um, I think like, when you're having like, a lot of data people in your company, um, um, having good cleaning, anomaly detection, making sure that you know, if there's gaps in your data that those are fulfilled, having good analytics, metrics, all that stuff. Even with that, like, I mean, just think what number of people and the amount of like, enterprise expertise you're required to just build this out. Even with that, you're still not there. You, that's when you can, like, you, know, you can get to like, A-B testing and experimentation. Once you have all of that, that's when you can actually get to like, the, the top of the pyramid, which is AI and, and deep learning. But companies want to get there really fast. And what happens is that you, they'll come and like, they'll ask somebody to come and build that for them. And instead of that pyramid, they get, end up getting houses of cards. And what that leads to is this really interesting effect where you, know, you have executives who have promised on earnings call that, you know, hey, we're using AI machine learning and whatnot, but they don't really know what the difference between like, you know, any of these terms are. Um, and then on the other side, you have these AI startups who are like, sort of at the peak of this Dunning-Kruger effect curve, which um, it's actually a phenomenal curve uh, if you like, explain so much about like, our president, for example, um, <laughs> which is that you know, when they know very little, they think they're so confident that everything is simple and they know everything about everything. But then actually when you start working with things, you know, things become you know, kind of complex. And so, I mean, think about the last time you tried to learn a new concept, right? And I mean, think about the last time you tried to learn a new like, machine learning algorithm, right? You know, when you first learned about it, it was like, it looks simple. Yeah, I mean, on the surface it's simple. But then when you start learning about it, it seems complex until you hit that light bulb moment. And you can start seeing the forest over the trees. Uh, sometimes quite literally if you're working around in forests. But, um, um, but the point is that you know, there's this sort of dichotomy and it's like creating this like, perfect storm. And a lot of you will find yourself in the midst of this perfect storm. Some of you will be like told by executives, like we want these like, you know, flying carpets. And then some of you might like, then end up you know, talking to these vendors who will sell you these flying carpets, but that actually turns out to be like, you know, a damp rug. Um, and uh, there's actually a whole lot of, uh, and because of that, there's actually a whole lot of sort of uh, what I call uh, like AIBS claims out there. Um, so these are some of the vendors, um, uh, you know, startups that we worked with at Levi's or actually like, explored to some extent. And um, these are some of the metrics that they claim. Now, anyone who's like ever done any like kind of web testing or like you know experimentation on the website, like, I mean, how 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 many of you say that you can get 367 uh, percent return on investment like you know with just one tool? Raise your hand. No, right. Uh, but you know these things, they, these companies claim like you know put us on your website and like your conversion is going to go up by like 80 percent, 90 percent. And one of them actually said something really funny, which um, let's see if how many of you can spot that. One company said, everyone who uses our tool tends to have 2x conversion, okay? This is a tool that you have to provide a whole bunch of, it's like a quiz, right? So you, you enter your personal data, you tell them what other clothes you wear, you tell them sort of like what your body type is, your height, weight, and all that kind of stuff. And then they say, people who you know, end up filling out this multi-page form tend to have 2x the conversion as compared to people who just randomly come to your website, browse on, and leave. Now, who thinks that's, you know, that there's no confounding factors here? Or who thinks there's like, you know, there's probably something called intent at play here, right? Um, and so that's partly what it is, is that sort of like, you know, when you think about like being data literate and like being able to ask the right questions, that's what a lot of it is, is like, you know, when you become a, when you think about becoming a data scientist, it's about being able to sort of like look at these sort of claims and be able to sort of tease out, you know, where there's like, you know, a hint of BS in the, in the picture. And so, and my, so my main point here is that as you sort of progress in your career as a data person, you'll encounter all of the, a lot of these uh, entities and just make sure that you can like, you know, uh, you sort of like filter out the BS from the actual signal. And uh, if you want some help in that, uh, there's actually a wonderful course by uh, a couple of professors at uh, uh, UW Washington called Calling Bullshit. That's the actual name of the course. They offer it as part of the standard uh, uh, sort of course offering, and uh, this is, they have some wonderful case studies, they talk about how even like seasoned researchers often use like misleading data and statistics and graphs to sort of peddle a message that is not completely true, 
And I would say this is, and they've made this course very accessible for like, you know, lay people as well. So make sure if you have decision makers in your, in your company who tend to fall for the BS, please recommend this course to them. And the other thing is, you know, in general, like you will see a lot of people misuse statistics very often. Um, and so that's why I think it's, it's good to keep in mind that sometimes it's, it's not that somebody's like purposely trying to mislead you. Sometimes people just don't know what they're doing, which is very common. There are not a lot of data literate people out there. So, you know, give them a second chance and try to like educate them as to like why what they're, you know, seeing or doing might be somewhat uh, misleading. The third mindset, and this might be a little bit sort of, uh, you know, um, sort of uh, uh, controversial, but it's like, I think a lot of data scientists can benefit by learning to think like a lawyer. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, let's say, okay, what I mean by that is, problems are often very ambiguous, and it's often important to like, um, sort of be able to categorize these, uh, like very clearly define these, uh, these, these, these problems. So I'll do a very simple like, question answer with, round with you, okay? Um, I'll show you a photo, and all you have to do is raise your hand if you think it's a sandwich. It's a very simple cognition task, like, you know, very simple. So, first one, how many of you think this is a sandwich? Raise your hand. Yeah, pretty much all of you, I guess, except a couple, um, which is fine. I mean, some people don't like peanut butter jelly, that's fine. How many of you think this is a sandwich? Or actually, yeah, keep your hands up if you think this is a sandwich, right, okay. Keep your hands up if you think this is a sandwich. Okay, so, so some people here are not French, because if you're French, then you would say, this is a tartine, of course, it's an open face sandwich. Keep your hands up if you think this is a sandwich. Oh, okay, only a couple hands left. Now, how many of you think this is a sandwich? Okay, okay, so no more hands left anymore. How many of you think any one of these is a sandwich? Nobody, right? Like, by this point, you're like, come on, man, like, what the hell? But if you were a lawmaker in Colorado, uh, this is an actual law that they passed, which is sandwiches are defined as single serving items such as hamburgers, hot dogs, frozen pizzas, burritos, chicken wings, et cetera. So even a chicken wing is a, wing is a, is a sandwich technically in, in Colorado. But you know, for most people, like, if you ask them like, you know, what's a sandwich, including like, Justice Ruth, Gitter, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, they would say, I, I know it when I see it. Now, this is fine for like, you know, a dumb question like, you know, what's a sandwich? But what happens when, you come, when it comes to fraud detection? Right? Um, you know, some of you might be working on you know, companies that are dealing with transactions um, with clients. Uh, and some of these clients might be in different countries. And some of these clients might be using you know, PayPal. Some of these clients might be using other kinds of payment methods. How do you detect what's, some, what's fraud and what's like, you know, a really confused customer who clicked some wrong buttons? How do you know something is fraud you know, versus like somebody like, you know, just buying a lot of gifts and returning them because they didn't like those gifts or whatever, right? There's many ways you can define fraud. And, uh, you know, in, in a lot of cases, what will happen is that you know, somebody will say, I want to use AI for fraud detection. And you have a project handed off to you, like, you know, here's all this data, I want to detect fraud. But what does fraud actually mean? Now, it becomes very important to then like, sort of really define the statement fraud. What is fraud? Um, and sort of, you know, we can't keep the I'll know it when I see it definition. We have to actually define it sort of in a way that can be measured you know, through metrics and through, like, you know, through data. Same thing when it goes to like the, you know, the poster child of startups in the Silicon Valley, CLTV. Um, you know, what does CLTV mean? Like, you know, uh, so CLTV actually has three terms in it, customer, lifetime, and value. Who is a customer? Is somebody who subscribed for your service but has never actually purchased, is that a customer? As somebody like, you know, who, who like made one transaction and returned everything, is that still a customer? Is somebody bought a gift card for somebody and, and never actually purchased a product from you, is that a customer? How do you define a customer? Lifetime, how long is a lifetime? Is there a limit to your lifetime? You know, if you're a subscription service, has somebody who has, like, you know, is there like an average, like, you know, lifespan of a customer that you're dealing with? And value, what is value? Is sharing on Facebook or Instagram value? Is like leaving a comment value? How do you define value? All these things are very important questions that, you know, I, I don't necessarily know if people are sort of trained to ask. Um, and, you know, the, the data scientists who tend to succeed the most um, tend to be people who can really tease out these, uh, you know, these, these, who can like discover what the fuzziness, where the fuzziness lies and then get really good clarity um, by talking to leadership there. And so um, it often helps, you know, to frame a problem like a legal statement. So, you know, if you ever, I mean, some, I think a number of you like have, I probably like, you know, either live in a home like that you leased or rented out, for example. Um, and so have you like looked at like, ever, like, your, like your agreements in the past or ever? Like, you know, just like, 
you know, when they define a tenant versus when they define a pet and all these things, like those are like, they're really long documents, right? And it's like, why are they so long? Because like the thing is that there, if there's any fuzziness, there's scope that you might be, you know, taken advantage of. And that's why all people who frame contracts, like they frame them in very specific language. And I would say that you would actually be more successful if you um, framed your problem statements like legal contracts, like, like very, like in very specific language. Because that actually, uh, prevents from scope creep and pre from from kicking in, and then also you know sort of in, uh, ensures that you're actually solving the problem that people want to be solved. Um, a lot of times, like when you go to leadership and you ask them, "Hey, what do you want?" They'll say, "You know, I want you know I want to increase customer lifetime value, or I want to reduce fraud." But then when you actually talk about specific scenarios, then you know then you have to ask them, like, "Do you care about this scenario? Do you care about that scenario?" and you know, and as you go through that process, the leadership and executives often learn what is important, what is not important, because they might not have necessarily thought about that, right? And that's the and that's the the first step I would say uh, of you know working on a problem is to actually work with leadership or work with the people who are defining a problem statement to actually get very specific language around it. There's actually a great quote which is um, that uh, like a problem well defined is a problem half solved. And so make sure like you're getting a well-defined problem to work on. Otherwise, things will get really, really tricky. And there's actually a great uh, quote by uh, Cassie uh, Kozrikov, uh, who, who's a great blogger. You should read her, uh, which is that when decision makers don't realize that thinking deeply is their job, remind them. So make sure you know you're working when you work with leadership. They, they understand this. The next point is uh, utilize uh, UI and UX to improve CX. So how many of you know what UI, UX, and CX are? Okay, so some of you. So UI is user interface, UX is uh, uh, user experience, and CX is customer experience. And I think some of uh, you know, the, the, the speakers before, they talked about sort of like, you know, it's all about the people, and it really is all about the people. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that a lot of us who sort of came out of like, who have CS degrees or like who came out of boot camps, a lot of us, we don't get exposure to like, the, the, the whole design world. And uh, like, even when you work at companies, a lot of times like, companies will like, sort of put these like, weird divides that, hey, you are data science. You are like the, the right brain, or I, don't, I forget which hemisphere is the analytical one. It's some BS anyway, but so it's like, you are these people, so you sit here, you work with these people. And you're design people, so you're like the, the fuzzy, like, you know, like sort of like, you know, like the, the, the touchy-feely type, so you sit here and you work with these people. I would say that's actually really bad, and like most companies shouldn't actually do that. And if you find yourself in a company like that, make sure to reach across the aisle, and I mean sometimes quite literally, to work with you know the, those people there. Now, um, and why why is it that I am that I'm putting such a, a lot of importance on that? So when you think about companies that you know are really good at like you know machine learning and all that kind of stuff, and who have like really like made an impact to the customer base, a lot of us will like you know think of Airbnb, Uber, Netflix, etc. Now the thing is. Um, you know, a lot of us will say that oh, these companies are, are you know became w what they are because you know they were really good at using data and machine learning. And I would say yes, that is part of the, the 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 answer. But the other part is that they were able to serve their customers in a way that their incumbents could not or did not care to. And sometimes they use machine learning. Sometimes they use like you know different business models. Sometimes they use like you know better customer service. And you know sometimes they were like just like you know more they paid more attention. They maybe like use some of the strategies. But really what it comes down to is that they really made sure that the end, at the end of the day, their customers' needs were prioritized above all else. And, and this is really the, the point of the story is that, you know, that once you prioritize the UI, UX of it, um, the, the customer experience, like, you know, magic can happen. But at the same time, and this is, I don't need to go into this experience again, uh, into this example again, but for example, uh, you know, the Facebook Messenger, like they launched a service where they said that, you know, you know, we'll launch a, a bot for you, and like you know, as a brand, you can just use this bot. It turns out like that bot wasn't able to understand 70% of the queries that customers made, and then you know, everyone knows about Tay now by now. Um, really bad, right? Um, and on the same like on, on like you know, on a similar note, like 41% uh, of the of customers said that they sh they stopped shopping because of poor personalization. Now everyone is using personalization, but some people use it like this. This is an Ashley email I received from this company called Kibo Commerce. Anyone who works there? No. Anyone who knows anyone who works there? Anyway, regardless, this is, a, this is an email that says, Levi's personalization strategy and it starts with high name. I mean, how bad is that strategy, right? Um, and then, like, this is like one of those things, right, where, like, you know, like, am I ever gonna do, the, am I ever gonna do business with this, this company? I don't think anyone else is gonna do business with them either. And it's not just this small, random startup, it's like, companies like Shutterfly, companies like, you know, Pinterest, uh, 
they've all like made fupas by sort of you know by having the wrong kind of personalization message on their website, and that really turns people off. It almost like trains people like to not pay attention to those personalized messages anymore. And so the point here is that it's not really about the algorithms to a certain extent because I mean you know. Pinterest you know, has a great machine learning team. Shutterfly probably has a great machine learning team. Kibo Commerce probably has a great machine learning team. But what has happened is that these companies, uh, these examples are sort of uh, stories where the machine learning team did not really care to work with the UX team to deliver a great experience. And, you know, and so really what can you do as a, as a data scientist or data person is that you can work with your, with your UI UX team and really design for trust. What that means is, like, you know, let's say you work on some kind of a, you know, this, this is a company that, uh, that creates um, uh, inboxes for marketers, and what they say is that they give this like, sort of like score, you know, like, you know, how important is this lead, for example. And then what they do is that if you click on it, it actually breaks down as to like why they think this is important, why they, why they, why they give this score, right? Um, and, you know, for example, uh, Amazon, like, you know, what they do is, above the rec recommendation carousel, they don't just say like, you know, recommend it for you. They actually, they actually specify it, why they are recommending this product to you. So one of the biggest issues that happens when, like, you know, when people see recommendations is that it's a random grab bag of things, right? It's like, so the first question that a lot of customers have is that, why am I seeing these random products you know, sorted here? And so the easier you can make it, make it for them to like, craft a story as to why these things are shown to them, you know, the more likely they are to interact with it. So when they say things like, customers who bought this also bought that, people who purchased similar items, like you know, looked at these other items, that, that tells people sort of, you know, this is why I'm seeing these items, plus it gives them the social proof that there are other people like me who think like, like I do. And so making things like, you know, that give you trust makes one, people more likely to interact with it, and then second, it makes people more likely to, you know, forgive the, you know, the algorithm for making mistakes. The other thing is that when you design interfaces, make sure you encourage feedback. And this is one thing that, you know, I mean, outside of like just collecting more training data, it also has a secondary effect on people, which, sort of you know, enables them to you know, also trust your algorithm more, which is that it makes them feel that, okay, there's somebody on the other side who's actually listening to my feedback. And so, for example, like, you know, it's not just enough to you know, sort of uh, you know, give a recommendation to people, but like, you, know, you can also make like, little, like, little like, thing at the bottom that says, how was the recommendation? Like, you know? And um, so, for example, when I was at Uber, we used to like, you know, put little smiley boxes everywhere so that you, know, you could just say like, you know, a thumbs up or a thumbs down or like a smiley face or like a frowny face, whatever. And so that way, like, you get a lot of ton of good feedback, and uh, it can actually augment your A-B testing with some additional data that actually explains why something worked versus why something didn't work. And the other thing is um, around uh, this concept of show, don't tell. And um, this is something I see a whole lot where, uh, you know, um, when, when you work on certain experiences, like, you know, we have this tendency to sort of, like, you know, get people to be like, oh, this can, can do this, it can do that. Turns out that when you actually show people something, you get a lot of good feedback. Um, and so there's a, a specific type of prototyping method called uh, Wizard of Oz prototyping, where just like in the movie where there's a man behind the curtain, um, you can actually have, you know, you can actually design your experiences. For example, let's say you're building a chatbot, or, you know, where you can, what you can actually do is that you can just have an actual human being behind it. And, you know, let's say you're trying to like do like a, I don't know, like a laptop finder, like, you know, somebody's trying to find a laptop on Best Buy's website. You can actually just put an actual, start, like, a, like a store associate behind it and like have them pretend to be a, 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 a bot. And then and, like, actually workshop the experience with them and see how they actually like it. Um, and so that's Wizard of Oz testing. And then the other thing is that you always should start with an MVP, which is that uh, you know, when we think about sort of delivering experiences, a lot of us like, tend to be like, you know, oh, we're gonna deliver this like, full on experience with like, all the bells and whistles and like, you know, it's gonna do like, you know, image recognition and like, recommendation and like, all that kind of stuff. And that's great, but the problem is that the, the customer might move on by then. If they have a need, you want to solve their need as quickly as possible, and even if it doesn't solve the, all their need, they, they will still like end up paying attention and up using it. So, for example, if they want like you know a car, which is a way to go from point A to point B, you can actually deliver a skateboard, which is not really the the thing they want, but it still like solves the problem to a certain extent. And and from there, you can keep progressing and learning and like keep solving the problem from you know for them as you progress. And uh, you know, don't take my word for it. It's actually something that Steve Jobs said, which is that you have to start with a customer experience and work backwards to technology. Now. How many times have you seen the opposite happening, where people start with the technology, like you know, I want to use deep learning to solve this problem, and then they like you know go around to, to, to figure out what the problem is. So like, and you know, and this is a common problem that a lot of us have because we are like you know technology nerds and we want to use technology for everything. So, but make sure like you're starting with the customer's need first and not from the technology. And so, 
Uh, and if you feel like this is like you know a completely new area for you and like you haven't heard about a lot of this, these are three great books that I would highly recommend. Like like I mean this one, Thinking Fast and Slow, was like released in like the 70s and they won like the Nobel Prize for it. And this the the other one like uh, Don't Make Me Think is like the the UI UX Bible. Like it's been around since the 90s basically. Um, and can't speak highly enough about Dan Norman. So anyway, read these books. These are great resources to get up and running with you know how to get you know better with design and like understanding customer experiences, et cetera. And so for my last mindset, um, uh, and this is something I think some, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we already talked about a little bit, but data science is a team sport. Um, and so in some cases, it can actually be an individual effort. Um, and it really depends upon the type of data science that's being practiced by your company or by your org. So there's, some, there's a number of data, different types of data science that are practiced today. The first one is uh, marketing PR centric, which is you know like when companies try to use that you know use data science for like you know increasing their stock price by making them like more relevant uh, for you know Wall Street analysts. Like I mean, we saw that that chart right number of people, number of companies trying to say AI in the earning calls. The second type is research centric. So there are definitely companies out there for whom uh, for which um, the the actual algorithms are running their 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 business need to be improved upon, and that's really their their secret sauce. So there's a lot of, some of those companies out there, and for them, like a lot of it's like sort of conventional research, where like one person works on one piece of the algorithm and sort of improves it in bits and pieces. There's a third type, which is recruiting centric. So there's some some companies out there where like they want to have a data science team or data science practice, uh, but the the only way they can like actually hire people for that is by sort of you know like throwing like you know look at all these co cool AI stuff that we're doing, and so that's one type of data science. And then there's the fourth type, which is very common in the Valley, which is like you know where the CEO wants to like you know basically make a bunch of similarity references in their talks. Um, and then there's a fifth type, which is um, what I call business centric, which is where the most important business decisions are made using insights derived from the scientific use of data. And guess what? This is the one where data science is actually a, a, a team sport. In all the other cases, like you can be like, like a lone wolf individual working by yourself and still you know you know, meet your goals, but if you find yourself working in a business-centric data science team, you have to be able to work in a team together. And what does that team look like? These teams are very cross-functional. They, they have people from many different areas and people who speak very different languages than you do. Um, I mean, sometimes quite literally, but like, you know, their, their term and terminologies could be very different. Like, you know, the way they understand the same idea can be very different. So for example, um, you know, when I say the word server, some of you will think of like you know you know a computer server, but some of you might think like you know a person who you know is like waiting tables in a restaurant, right? And and there are many examples of, of like you know terms which are you know used you know sort of like um, um, by differently by different teams. And really, what happens is that when you are when you are working in a business centric data science team, you have to learn to work with a lot of these kinds of individuals. And uh, the the core thing is that you know when you're working in a in in, a, in, a, in such a cross functional team. You, you need to be part of the roadmap development, and you need to understand the roadmap development process. And there's a concept by the, this company called Ideo, uh, which is a great design research firm, which talks about the, the, the circles of customer desirability, business viability, and technological feasibility. And you want to work on things which are like right in the middle of those. So what do I mean by that? So let's say the customer desires a number of things, uh, which is, let's say, like they want free one-hour delivery on orders, like they want Beyonce to look from Coachella, or they, you know, want to experience, like, you know, they say, like, hey, I don't like shopping online because, like, I can't feel the garment on my phone. So, you know, when you go to the business, they might say that, you know, okay, in terms of business viability, getting like free hour, one hour delivery on like peanuts and like socks is not viable. So I'm not going to do that. But I mean, everything else is fine by me if you can like execute it from the technology side. On the technology side, you might say, yeah, we don't just, we just don't have like the haptic technology right now to like experience garments on the phone right now, but. You could use a bunch of computer vision and like an you know, image like, processing and recommendation to like actually you know find the outfit uh, for your fav like your most favorite like celebrity. So bang, that's where you that's what you want to build. And really, when you think about business driven like data science teams, that is the kind of roadmap development process you want to follow. And uh, you know these are cue cards that you can use uh, for like ideation, like you know how do you come up with ideas that we can work on, for example. And there's like a number of examples here. And that's mostly it from my side, and I'm out of time, but uh, I want to do a quick recap, which is uh, you know, the five mindsets that will help you succeed as a data scientist or as a data person in general are data science is a process of extracting concise and actionable insights from data through scientific rigor, uh, practice healthy skepticism towards most remarkable claims, and cautious optimism towards the applicability of positive results. So when you see the next, like, you know, this is a breakthrough in deep learning research, like, you know, cautious optimism helps you. 
Um, before executing, first craft a precise problem statement. Think like a lawyer. Um, and, uh, and you know, develop this with decision makers and executives uh, using data and subject matter expertise. Uh, um, focus on improving the customer experience and make the customer journey intuitive and frictionless. Personalization is not about like knowing somebody by name, it's about making sure that they can get from point A to point B faster. And then learn to communicate and collaborate with an interdisciplinary teams to build products that lie in the intersection of desirability, viability, and feasibility. Um, so I guess we don't have time for questions, but I guess we'll open it up for questions later. Thank you. <laughs>